Welcome all and thank you for joining today's session. My name is Michael Downey and it's great to be on board for another AWRI webinar. Now the AWR, AWRI is running three additional webinars before the end of the year, including a session on heat proofing vineyards, soil health and a bomb weather outlook for vintage 2020. So jump onto the AWRI website if you'd like to register for any of those sessions. Today's session, however, investigates automated dissolved gas management systems, in particular, the use of membrane contactor systems. Uh, before I jump over to today's um, presentation, some very quick reminders for you, the audience. Um, to provide a comment or to ask a question, please open the Q&A button or section of the webinar toolbar, type in your question and click to send it through. There's also the option of getting involved through Twitter. Please use the handle at the underscore AWRI. And just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and it will be available to view via the AWRI's YouTube channel. Um, all registrants will receive a link to, to view that recording after the session. For those of you that have just joined us, welcome today's AWRI webinar, which takes a look at membrane contactors for dissolved gas management. Uh, will be presented by the AWRI's Dr. Simon Nordesgaard. Uh, Simon's in the room with me today, and he's a senior, senior engineer at the AWRI, who's worked in wine industry research and development for 15 years, and is passionate about technology and its adoption in the wine sector. Simon, it's fantastic to have your expertise and enthusiasm on hand for today. And with that, I'll hand over to you to get us started. So thanks, thanks, Michael, and thanks uh, to everybody for tuning in to today's webinar. Um, today, I'm going to talk a bit about dissolved gas management um, with a focus on membrane contactors. Firstly, I'm just going to go through some, some information on gas properties and particularly solubility. Um, so at 20 degrees um, in one atmosphere of air, you can dissolve up to 1460 milligrams per litre of carbon dioxide, 8 milligrams per litre of oxygen, or 14 milligrams per litre of, uh, of nitrogen. So I guess the thing that stands out is that carbon dioxide is a lot more, more soluble than oxygen and, and nitrogen. Um, so much more so that we uh, typically express it in terms of grams per litre instead of milligrams per litre. With gases, something to remember is that gases are more soluble at, uh, at, at lower temperatures. If we look at carbon dioxide, for example, at, at 40 degrees, you can, uh, you can dissolve um, less than one, milli one gram per litre, but at zero degrees, solubility is closer to three grams per litre. Um, the different gases, of course, have different roles in, 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 in wine production. Carbon dioxide is stylistic. White wines generally have uh, higher values uh, specifications than, 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 in, uh, than red wines. And there's also practicalities um, too. Um, for example, for bagging box uh, wines and filling flexi tanks, um, you don't want to have too much carbon dioxide. Otherwise, if the uh, temperature rises, CO2 uh, solubility decreases, you can, might have problems with, uh, with bags bursting. Um, the relationship between oxygen and, and wine is a, is a complex one, but I guess for our purposes, we can, we can summarise it. Typically, it's un, un, undesirable in wine can oxidise um, desirable constituents and, and shorten product uh, shelf life. And wineries put a lot of effort preventing, into preventing oxygen getting into wine and removing it when it does. So before I get into talking about adjusting dissolved gas levels with membrane contactors, I want to quickly review how wineries uh, adjust dissolved gases at the, at the moment and the basic mechanisms involved. So I guess when wineries want to adjust dissolved gas levels, they inject bubbles of gas, generally the carbon dioxide or nitrogen. It's done via a, a sinter, typically with a porosity of around 15 microns. That sinter could be, could be uh, hanging in a tank or attached to a tank valve, or it could be uh, in line with, um, with gas being injected as the wine is pumped between tanks or recirculated back into the same tank. Um, generally, people run for a while. Um, when they think it's likely to become be in spec, they come back and they, and they, and they do some... Um, that line measurements to check that it's that it's in specification and often to get the oxygen low enough and the co2 to the right level you might need separate separate steps of uh, of carbon dioxide and, and nitrogen 
So I've got a drawing here to, to illustrate the process. So let's, let's say we want to, uh, we want to reduce the, the oxygen and, and carbon dioxide level in the wine and we, we circulate on that, um, on, that, uh, on that tank and inject nitrogen through a, an inline uh, uh, sinter. So the nitrogen bubbles go in and are mixed around in the wine, um, you know, initially in the, in the hose after injection and then in the, in, the, in the tank. Now let's just zoom in on, a, uh, on one of these nitrogen bubbles and it could be, it could be in, the, in the line before it gets back into the tank or in the tank. And what's happening is we've got this nitrogen bubble um, and, uh, and there's gas exchange occurring at the bubble walls. So I guess in the wine, there's gonna be more oxygen than in our pure nitrogen bubble. Um, and that, that, uh, that, that uh, difference in, in concentration will lead to some of the oxygen going into the nitrogen bubble. Um, similarly for carbon dioxide, there's more carbon dioxide in the, in the wine than in our, our pure nitrogen bubble. So, so some of the carbon dioxide will go from the, um, from the wine into the, in, into the bubble. Um, we'll also get some transfer of nitrogen. Um, um, since the nitrogen bubbles, it's got more nitrogen, is a higher concentration of nitrogen than the wine. Um, however, we won't get a lot of nitrogen going into the, into the wine because the, the wine is often almost uh, uh, already saturated with nitrogen since nitrogen gets used regularly throughout the winemaking process and the air that wine sometimes contacts is 79% nitrogen. So ultimately the nitrogen bubbles um, come out the top of the tank and with them they take some of that, that oxygen carbon dioxide that's, that's gone into them as the, as the, as the nitrogen bubbles have, have passed through the wine and that's where those gases have actually go. Um, so in this example, uh, we're sparging using nitrogen, but similar principles apply as if you're injecting sparging with carbon dioxide. The difference um, is that there's likely to be more uh, dissolution of carbon dioxide bubbles into the wine because carbon dioxide, as we've talked about, is much more soluble in, uh, in wine than, than nitrogen. So membrane contactors, what are they and, and how, do they, how do they work? Well, basically they work with a, there's a membrane, as you'd expect. Um, it's hydrophobic and it has... Uh, very small holes. Um, you put an aqueous stream like wine on one side and you, you run a, a gas or apply a vacuum on the other side. Um, the small pores and their, their hydrophobic nature has the effect of, um, of holding the wine at the surface. The wine can't actually get through. Um, it's just held at the surface um, next to the gas or vacuum on the other side. Um, the membrane is simply providing an interface for contact between the liquid and gas streams, such that gas molecules can, um, can diffuse between them. Um, during this transfer, gas molecules remain in solution, so there's no, there's no bubbles. So here's an example. Um, let's say we have uh, wine flowing on one side of this membrane, and the wine's got some carbon dioxide, some nitrogen and oxygen in it. If in the other side, we, we pull using a, a vacuum, there's no carbon dioxide, oxygen, and nitrogen in, in, in on that side originally. So, um, so the, the the wine is going to uh, the the all three gases are going to go into our, our our vacuum stream, and we're going to remove them from from the wine to some extent. Alternatively, if we instead of using a vacuum, we 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 applied carbon dioxide on the other side of the membrane to the wine. There's going to be more carbon dioxide in that in our carbon dioxide stream gas stream than in the wine. So the carbon dioxide will diffuse into the wine and will increase our, our, our wine carbon dioxide concentration. Um, the carbon dioxide stream, though, however, doesn't have any oxygen or nitrogen in it. So at the same, same time as we add carbon dioxide, we also remove some of the oxygen and the nitrogen from the wine. Now, what we can do is we can use a combination of these two approaches that I've, that I've showed, applying carbon dioxide and also pulling a vacuum. Um, and by doing that, we can actually uh, adjust carbon dioxide up or down at the same time as removing some nitrogen um, and oxygen. Um, we, can, we can use this technology for, 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 for minor tweaks to the carbon dioxide levels, you know, maybe going up from one gram per litre to one and a half grams per litre or, or the other way. Um, but we can also use it to... Uh, for full for full carbonation, you know, going up to twelve grams per liter if if you want. 
And when I say I, I, that you can put carbon dioxide up or down and remove oxygen at the same time, I guess the system can't control for everything. So if, you, if you're setting based on carbon dioxide and you, you get that spot on, you might only remove some of the oxygen. That'll probably be enough in most cases. Um, but if there's massive amounts of oxygen, then you may not remove as, remove as much as you need. Uh, now, while membrane contact is a different to sparging, the same physical laws apply. Um, I guess gas exchange is really just occurring at the membrane pores as a, instead of at the surface of a sparging bubble. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of similarities. This is really just, so these, these schemes I've, I've illustrated here are just one embodiment of the technology. For example, instead of using a, a, a vacuum to remove carbon dioxide and oxygen, we could also use nitrogen as our, as our, as our, as our strip gas. Um, but then you'd need a nitrogen supply as well and you'd be adding nitrogen um, uh, to, to the wine. Um, you also don't have to, to do adjustment all in one stage. You could have multiple membrane modules operating in series. For example, one focusing on oxygen removal and another then focusing on carbon dioxide adjustment. So these membranes, um, they come in, come in modules. And this is a picture illustrating uh, the module configuration. Um, the, uh, the, there are 300 micron diameter fiber, hollow fiber membranes. I mean, it's somewhat similar to a, to a, to a cross flow filter. Um, and, um, and these, are, these, these fibers are knitted together in an array and that's wrapped around a central distribution collection tube. Um, the liquid, the wine travels across the outside of the hollow fibers while the gases or vacuum run through the middle of the fibers. Just contrasting this technology quickly with uh, with uh, cross flow microfiltration because this would be the the, the, uh, the membrane technology probably that people will be most familiar with. Um, the feed liquid is is uh, is is going across the outside of the hollow fibers instead of through the middle um, like it like it would in a in a, in a normal cross flow microfilter. But really, the key difference, fundamental difference, is that the liquid is not passing through the membrane like in a cross flow microfilter. The liquid is just staying on one side of the membrane and, and just al allowing intimate contact between the gas and the and 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 the wine, so that gases can diffuse into or out of the wine. And and that that really that that contact that it's providing is 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 why it's called a membrane contactor. Many many different companies are, are now building uh, membrane contactor gas adjustment systems for the wine industry. Um, and it's, it's probably not, it's not always clear, but it appears that they all use the same membrane modules, same membranes from, from and they're made by, by, by 3M. Um, the, and, and these, it's called, they're called Liqu Liquicel, that's, the, that's the, the specific product. But you can see that these systems are quite, quite different, there's, there's examples. Um, the membrane's only one part of the, of, of the system. Uh, there's differences in in format automation. I mean, the one on the, the, the far right is is it's, it's it's largely just a just a membrane with some some basic controls, while the others have have got quite sophisticated have, do have quite sophisticated systems. Um, in terms of the current adoption levels of this technology, uh, there's there's more than fifty system winery installations uh, in in Europe. Um, Germany seems to be the most enthusiastic adopter of the technology. In Australia, um, you know, there are currently only a small number of units. Uh, there's three that, are, that, I'm, that I'm aware of. So membrane contact is, they're, sort of, they're new, they're relatively new for the Australian wine sector, but the technology itself has been around for a, for a while. Um, they were, this uh, membrane contacts to be used in some industrial applications in the 1990s. Um, this is a picture from a, from a, a, a page from a, of a, of a, a industry magazine from the, from 1996. It was, um, this was an article written by the, the manufacturer. The applications to wine really began in the mid 2000s. Um, some, some German and French wine research institutes um, began to trial the technology. And even in Australia, while we, we might not have known that we were, were using them. They were used around that time as well, just in a different way. Um, the MEMSTAR dealkalization process uses evaporative extraction for dealkalization of, uh, of an alkyl-rich uh, permeate stream from reverse osmosis of wine. Um, 
and this process is performed with a membrane contactor. It's just using a strip water um, instead of a strip gas or, or vacuum that we'd use when we're using it in gas adjustment applications. You can even use just the membrane contactor with water on the strip side for, for some dealkalization without the prior RO stage, um, but there will be some loss of volatiles that, that will become more significant um, for larger reductions in, in alcohol content. So a few points here about um, when in the winemaking process you might use membrane contactors. Firstly, the wine has to be well clarified before putting it through a membrane contact, otherwise you, you block it up. Um, and this is, this is generally going to tend to lead to uh, the technology being most applicable later in the, the winemaking process. For example, after cross flow filtration, microfiltration. But to make the absolute best use of some of the more sophisticated uh, uh, arrangements with inline uh, uh, you know, precise gas adjustment, the ideal time could be to use it directly on the, bot on the, the bottling line. Because I guess if you use it too much earlier in the winemaking process, there's a risk of you um, if you're adjusting it to some tight spec and then it, and then it goes out of spec again by the time it's bottled. Um, but obviously, if you if you if you're doing it directly on the on the on the bottling line, you have to be pretty certain that it's uh, that it that the control systems are appropriate. Um, you uh, th th they need to be able to handle line stoppages, variations in flow rate, etc. That's uh, it's hard to go back once it's in the bottle. So just. Uh, oops. I guess looking more at control systems on membrane contactors, I guess membrane technologies in general can sometimes be a little bit difficult to use. If you think about things like cross flow filtration, it's really some of the control systems and the, and the automation that, that bring it all together and make them really, really practical and useful. And I, I reckon this principle probably applies even more so for, for membrane contactors. Um, I guess a lot of the, the sort of the more automated systems have dissolved gas sensors to allow control to a, to a set point. And I'd say that some of the dissolved gas sensors, they work really well in combination with membrane contactors because the gases are staying dissolved during transfer. And then you should be able, so you should be able to measure the gas levels, dissolved gas levels very soon after they've been um, altered by a, by, by a membrane. Because this is in contrast to sparging systems where you're explicitly introducing bubbles and, and gas exchange is going to continue to occur between the wine and the bubbles all the way until the, bottom, the bubbles uh, leave the, the top of the tank. I guess in regards to, to some of the cost of some of the sensors, the CO2 uh, sensors, uh, they're, they're, they're quite expensive. So they add significantly to the cost of the machine. But I'd say some way of accurately assessing carbon dioxide is, is, really, is really key to making it all work and be automated. Some of the systems use clever mathematical models as well to improve performance. Um, as we're, and in conjunction, sometimes in conjunction with CO2 sensors and sometimes with, without them. Oxygen sensors are a lot cheaper than CO2 sensors, so they don't add a huge amount to the cost of the machine. Um, people would be probably familiar with some of these optical fluorescence quenching based uh, oxygen sensors that are now offered by many suppliers. Um, that seem to be a lot more robust than the traditional uh, electric, electrochemical oxygen sensors that were used by, by wineries. Um, overall, I, I'd say if you're, uh, if you're in investing in um, some automated dissolved gas system, it's probably the, I'd be inclined to not economize on the, the control systems because if you, if you are gonna go down that path, of the path of one of these sorts of systems, because it's the, the package that makes it all work together um, and really, make it a, a step forward over over sparging. Um, if you don't get all those, some, some of these things, it might be worth just sticking with, with, with sparging. Membrane contactors, I'll go into some specific costs soon, but they're expensive. So um, and you wanna take good, uh, take good care of them. Um, there are some restrictions on cleaning chemicals. You can use caustic solutions, but some proprietary uh, cleaning solutions used in wineries do contain additives that might damage them. So you do need to make sure that using the right cleaning chemicals um, and you need to work through that with whoever's supplying a system. Um, you also need to make sure that the water temperature is not too high um, as you can, you can damage the, the membrane. 
So ultimately, the the membrane life is is going to depend on how you use it. Um, but three to five years has been suggested as typical by some suppliers. One one uh, interesting difference between membrane contactors and sparging is their impact on dissolved nitrogen levels. So we went through our scheme of, of sparging with nitrogen before, um, and you, you do add some nitrogen to the wine. While with um, membrane contactors, um, you can, if you're using a vacuum and CO2 um, on the strip side, you, you're going to remove um, nit nitrogen. So this could have some positive uh, benefits if you're having issues with foaming over during on, on your bottling line. Um, so it's going to be often products that are near the solubility limits of the of the carbon dioxide. Um, and if this is foaming over is limiting line speed, if you can, if you, with this sort of system, you may be able to bottle faster, but you're only going to get this potential benefit of foaming over is currently rate limiting. Um, there are two, really two aspects that might contribute to less foaming. If you're using one of these membrane contactors, there's um, first, there's this nitrogen removal, but there's also better carbon dioxide solubilization since it's introduced um, dissolved instead of via bubbles. Um, I don't know the relative contributions of each, or I don't have any, in, any independent data on to prove whether this uh, this uh, how much difference it, it makes. So it's something you'd have to have to test test out for yourself. So cost. Um, I mean, there's no denying that this sort of technology is expensive compared with sparging with a sinter, but it's really a different level of technology. Um, if you use it in the right way, you can just set a desired carbon dioxide level in line and remove, remove oxygen as well. Um, this, this unit, which I, was, I went and saw some trials on back in 2017, and I've seen it again, um, this, is, this costs $180,000 um, when, when, when I was, saw those original trials. Um, membranes cost about forty thousand um, dollars, so uh, that's uh, and and that does have to be replaced every probably three to three to five three to five years. So, what sort of flow rates can you get for that for that sort of expense? Um, these were some 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 results um, from those trials I saw um, of what 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 it could do this this unit. Um, so there was a, a wine that started at 0.95 grams per liter of CO2 and and it was we were able to to put it up to 1.7 grams per liter at 18,700 liters per hour and it was actually the probably could have gone faster it was just that was the the, the pump uh, limit um, and then there's a uh, and then there was another instance where we were doing uh, where we were able to go from 1.5 grams per liter up to nine grams per liter and we were able to do that at 8,000 liters per hour. Um, then reducing carbon dioxide levels, we're able to go from 1.3 to 0.5 grams per litre at 4,000 uh, uh, litres per hour. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, the speed that you can go at is is going to depend on on what specific application your specific application is and the temperature that you're you're um, that you're performing it at. Uh, I think. It's, yeah, it's important that units are a size for your your requirements. From from these uh, observations, I guess I tend to say that you you're probably going to need more membrane area um, when you're requiring heavy carbon dioxide removal. Um, and I guess typical applications where you you might be needing to do that are, are, are red wines, bag in box, and and, and flexi tanks. So. But I mean, you can use the same control system and stuff. You just might need multiple uh, mem membrane modules. So coming back to, to where I sort of started on, on some of the, the, the sparging, I just wanted to give a few, uh, I guess, cheaper options that um, uh, people could also consider if they're, if they're not, if they don't have the budget or, or you know, at this stage to, to, to go for a, for a, a, a membrane contactor system, a lot of a lot of sparging at wineries is 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 quite is quite basic. There's a there's a fairly small sinter uh, surface area, sinter um, in, in, in a in a in a pipe, um, and there's not really any 
uh, just relying on the the, natu- the turbulence of the of the wine to to mix it in. There are um, sparges available from uh, from the major uh, sort of uh, like fittings and pipe fittings suppliers, like in Adelaide, like W. E. Ware and, and Co. and 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 Wems in 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 New York, um, that 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 make an effort uh, to to provide a greater center um, surface area and some uh, elements to improve the the mixing in of the of the of the gas uh, uh, bubbles because um, I mean bas- basically in terms of gas gas exchange when you're sparging you want lots of small bubbles so there's lots of bubble surface area for gas exchange to occur and you want these these to be really mixed in well so you get all of the, the wine contacting the bubbles and you you get that gas exchange and often as i say often it's probably not not done as 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 well as it as it could be so that's that's sort of a, an op, a relatively cheap opportunity these are just approximate approximate prices but they're they sort of it's not that much more expensive to go to a slightly more sophisticated um sparger um and some suppliers are also uh using sparging techniques but they're they're incorporating um, some automation and and some carbon dioxide and oxygen sensors, and they're sort of a, I guess probably a an in between um, the basic sparges and sort of a membrane contactor system uh, um, option, uh, and I guess they're if you're recirculating on a on a tank, um, they can be quite useful because you can you can set them to to uh to to to, to pump and sparge until um and, and until the set point is is reached whether it be for, for oxygen or, or carbon dioxide um uh levels um so as i said i think yeah if you if you adopt some of the more efficient sparging uh, arrangements you might waste le- less uh, nitrogen carbon dioxide you get to specification faster, um, and I think when you're in uh, at times of the process, particularly earlier on in the process as well, when there's 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 going to be more solids, there's uh, they're maybe more applicable than a membrane contactor, and it's also it's probably for in tank recirculation treatments. It's probably the way to go. I think the the thing that the the membrane contactor systems can really excel at is those inline inline treatments where you're you're uh, adjusting to a to a, a set level as you as you perform a, a, a an, an operation um, whether it be on the on the on the on the on the bottling line or maybe off the off the back of the cross flow filter so just concluding um i think membrane contactors are you know a very interesting technology and it's, they've been around for a while and they're commercially available and they're they're in use by some wineries and it's not by no means uh, widely adopted in Australia at, at this point, um, but uh, yeah, I think they're really um, uh, could be a could be a real uh, step change sort of technology. Um, when you sort of look at the winery process, I mean, I think they potentially allow for for, for loose sort of CO two specifications and for things just to be uh, to just to be adjusted on the on on the bottling line. But as I said, they're, they're quite expensive, and um, there's uh, some limitations regarding product clarity. But as I said, I think it could be transformational if they're used in the correct way. There are some cheaper opportunities for for sparging improvements um, from using different sparge designs, and they're and they're already you, you can you can buy them buy them now. So I think that's that's something that uh, that, that people can look at as 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 well. Um, I just want to thank um, all the suppliers who sort of provided some of the information that's um, that's gone into my understanding of this 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 topic. Allowed me to go and see units, etc. Um, so K and H, 3M, PTI Pacific, Winequip, W Wear and Co, Wems, Parsec, Wine Energy, and, and Rumfill, um, and uh, some of the wineries that I um, uh, that trialed that K and H unit that I attended in 2017. And, and, and finally, um, yeah, great girls and, and winemakers and, uh, and, and Wine Australia for, for, for funding um, at uh, AWRI. So thank you. That's uh, 
wraps up my my talk. I think Michael's going to see if there's any questions. Yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Simon, for providing such a comprehensive uh, report on that, on this equipment. Um, Simon is going to stick around for a little while to answer any of your questions. So uh, this is your opportunity. If you've got any questions you'd like to ask around this topic, um, please start sending them through. Uh, just a reminder, if you do want to ask a question, open up the Q&A part of your webinar toolbar and type and send your question through. Uh, while we wait for questions, quick one from me, Simon. Um, do you have any expectations around uptake moving forward? I, imagine cost is probably the, the biggest obstacle currently. Do you expect that to, to change going forward? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, uh, they're probably gonna remain as expensive as, as they are, but I think it will, they will be, end up being adopted by all the large producers. It might take, might take some time. I sort of, I see it as almost uh, a, maybe not quite as important as cross flow filtration, microfiltration, but that sort of um, uh, potential step change technology. And I think probably, probably the bigger um, facilities and particularly some of the, those that are, that are, are packaging, I think they're probably the ones that will, will adopt it, adopt it first and then it'll, it'll gradually filter through to, to others. But I think it'll probably take some time because they're expensive. Sure. Thanks for that, Simon. Uh, so we have had a comment come through. Thanks for your comment, Erwin. Um, Erwin's comment is another important benefit is being able to adjust gas concentration without temperature adjustments. Did you want to make any comments around that, Simon? Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's, I mean, you're always governed by the, the solid solubility limits, but it's, uh, but yeah, it's much, uh, it's much easier because you're you're uh, there's no bubbles. You're it's, it's staying dissolved the whole time. Great, thanks for your comment there, Erwin. Another one from Erwin: degassing with sparges, they need to warm up wine. Do you... same, same 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 principles um, ag again? Um, I guess. Solubility is is, um, is is the same rules apply with solubility when you're using it in a in a um, in a membrane contactor or or a, or a sparger. But it's likely that you'll be able to with a with a membrane contactor have to warm up the wine less to to uh, to to get it out or, or not not at all. You know, so it's definitely going to be it's going to be an in, in improvement on, on on sparging in that respect. Absolutely. Thanks for your question there, Erwin. Um, question here from Joel. So thanks for your presentation. Is there a risk of removing other small molecules with this technology, just like using DEALC? So I, I'd say that uh, probably not, not at, sig at significant levels. I mean, gases are a lot more volatile than the most, than most wine flavor compounds. Um, and flavor losses have been shown to be negligible in some trials performed in in France. I think one of the one of the pre uh, articles I sent uh, for the supplied for the pre reading had some had a study looking at um, at uh, at uh, uh, flavor impacts of, of sparging and um, and membrane contactor use. Okay, thanks for your question, Joel. I've got another one from. Uh, Greg, do you see that there might be a way to be able to run with high solids at some point in the future? Um, I mean, I can't really comment from the, uh, as, I mean, that's be up to the manufacturers, but I mean, I, I probably can't see it happening at, at the moment. Um, but 
you know, I'm, I'm definitely not, uh, uh, I guess it's 3M or whoever else develops these sorts of membranes that'll be the, that are the real experts on the, the membrane construction. But at the moment, I, I can't see it happening. No. Sure. Um, question here from Amanda. Have you seen any difference with regard to CO2 bubble size um, when comparing membrane contactors versus sparging? So I guess I'd, I'd say initially uh, the, uh, the bubbles going in there, they're not even bubbles, it's, it's dissolved. So there, there is a difference immediately, but I think in the, in the, in the, in the long term, after a, I, I don't think there'd be any, any difference between sparging and, um, and using membrane contactors. Um, I guess uh, people always talk about the differences in, in bubbles with uh, uh, bottle fermented um, sparkling sparkling wine, um, but I mean a lot of that relates to uh, uh, different levels of other wine constituents that that influence the bubble uh, dynamics. So I think I think with a membrane contactor, yeah, there'll be it's it's going to be different dif a different like immediately after you've you've made the gas addition, addition, but but after time it won't make it wouldn't 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 make a difference. Okay. Thanks, Simon, and thanks, Amanda, for your question. Another one here, has there been any studies done on efficiencies of sparging versus contactors in terms of gas usage? So, yeah, one of the, the, uh, the pre-read papers that I, I sent, that does that same study that talks about the, um, the, uh, the um, flavour impact of, of uh, being negligible in, with membrane contactors also does include some calculations on, on, on gas use. Um, it Sorry, Simon, which study was that one? So it's the one. I've got it. I've got it here. It's fine. I think it's uh, by by uh, by Andreas Blank and Jean Claude Vidal from from uh, from Inra. Um, so that was that was one of the the papers, and I, we can send the link around to that that again. Um, I'm pretty sure that includes some some economics. Um, and I might I'll have a double check if there are some other. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's a there's a gas use. There's definitely a gas use comparison. Um, to, to, to be honest, I think the there will be a, a re, there's definitely going to be a, a reduction in 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 gas in gas use because you're actually you're you're using it directly as opposed to putting in bubbles that are going to come out the top of the top of the tank and some of it uh, where where some of it is being used, but really it's sort of a a, a vehicle for the for the for the for the gas exchange. So you'll be using less when you use um, a membrane contactor. Um, I don't know whether that will actually pay for the cost of a system. I would, I would, I would suspect that probably the biggest advantage of these sorts of systems is the way your 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 process um, reducing reducing steps, um, doing things in line on the on the on the bottling line uh, directly. Um, less reprocessing that that sort of thing. I I, I would see that as the biggest um, benefit of the of of the technology. Okay, great. Thanks for your question there, Richard. And we'll make sure that paper is circulated again in the in a follow up email after the session. Um, another question here from Brett. Um, Simon, can you speak to whether there is a volume of wine that suppliers suggest that can go through a membrane contact before replacement is required? So there's, I mean, some may suggest, but I haven't, I haven't heard any specific suggestions. I guess people are very hesitant about making um, specific comments because it, it, it depends a lot on things like how they're, how they're cleaned, what type of uh, wine it is. Um, there's a lot of factors that that will affect it. So um, that three to five years, I've heard mentioned by by several people. Um, some I know from speaking with some people in Germany that have probably only given their system quite light use. That it was, you know, their their membrane had lasted a lot a lot longer than that. Um, I, I guess with it's one of these things that will probably only, it's a bit like cross flow filters. It's probably only going to learn more specifically with, with, with real, um, a lot of experience with, um, um, with similar products. Um, but I mean, if I was 
buying one, I'd, I'd probably, um, and giving it quite heavy use, but taking care of it, I, I think you, you'd probably budget on assuming it's going to last three years and um, at quite heavy use. And then if it uh, if it lasts five years or or more, that's a that's that's a, that's a, that's extra extra benefit. Um, but yeah, obviously there would be if if really really stringent um, studies were done, you could you could determine a value. But I suspect those sort of studies won't ever, ever happen, and it'll just be through in, in empirical in practice that you that it, that 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 will be determined. But I, I yeah, I'd, I'd budget on 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 three years at heavy heavy use. Okay, thanks for your question there, Brett. Don't have any further questions, so I think we will wrap it up there, Simon. Um, if you do have any questions that you um, that you think of post session, I'm I'll speak for Simon here. I'm sure he's more than happy to uh, hear from people directly. Um, so I will. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Send me an email or, or, or give me a call. I'm more than happy to help in any way I can. Yeah. So I'll make sure Simon's, uh, contact details are included in a, in the post session follow up email. Um, Simon, would you mind just slipping through to the next slide for me or the final slide there? Um, so I'd like to just first wrap up by saying a big thank you to Simon for providing today's, um, content and some really key learnings for um, the audience. Um, I'd also like to thank the audience for participating in today's session. Um, all attendees will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recording as well as some additional information. The next AWRI webinar is on Thursday, the 21st of November. Two researchers from the National Wine and Grape Industry Centre will be joining to discuss heat proofing vineyards. So if you haven't already registered and you'd like to do so, please visit the AWRI website. Thank you again, um, and I look forward to seeing you at the next AWRI webinar.